Welcome back to CFRs, the audacious video cast by the team at whatmatters.com. And as always, I'm joined by Elizabeth. Elizabeth, hello. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everybody. Hey, Ryan, before we get started, I want to ask you a quick fire question, given that it's grading time for a lot of teams. You up for it? Absolutely. What's your best advice for grading? But there's a twist in one sentence. Go. Let me take a big breath. Do it quickly and blamelessly. That's my advice. Do the grading process quickly and blamelessly. How about you, Elizabeth? What's your best advice you give to teams? Don't panic. Joining us today is Peter Kappas. Hey, Peter. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey, Peter. It's nice to see you. Peter is an organizational coach based in the UK that uses OKRs and agile practices to help teams maximize clarity, delivery, and joy. Hey, Peter. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, wait a second. You both are across the pond in the UK. Oh, I know. We have plans after the pandemic. I think Peter's buying the coffee. <laughs> right, Peter? Peter? Lots of beer. <laughs> Whatever oh, beer. For this. <laughs> I, I wish I could join you both, especially. I mean, I'm hopeful this year that the pandemic does have an ending to it. Um, but today, today we're going to talk about goal setting for teams where OKRs might not be the obvious choice. And Peter, you work a lot with teams that run into this moment. And could you tell us more about that and maybe the teams that you work with? Yeah, I've been lucky to work across a variety of different industries from government and nonprofits, but also banks and scientific research. And I work with a lot of product teams uh, where OKRs are a pretty natural fit, but then there are a lot of teams where they don't quite fit as well. Uh, so things like uh, operational support, customer service, um, scientific research, finance, legal, all of these teams, uh, sometimes they say, well, you know, it's, it's great if you're on a product team and you're getting all this real-time feedback from customers. But what if I'm just kind of in the back office doing my thing day in, day out? How can I use OKRs? So, yeah, they struggle a little bit. Absolutely. And, well, when you work with these different teams, the research ones, the operation teams, the support teams, what's one of their biggest challenges when you spend time with them? So a lot of times these teams feel like they don't have a lot of control over what's coming. So, for example, uh, at a large UK media company, they were telling me in the operations team, hey, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in three hours, let alone in three months. So how can we set OKRs? And uh, the other big problem that a lot of these teams have is that they're not actually teams. They're more like work groups. So instead of having those complementary skill sets and that mutual accountability for shared outcomes and a common purpose, you have experts who are kind of working alone on their own little, little piece. And so uh, often the first thing they have to do is to clarify the, the purpose that they have as a team and to recognize what they're doing as a team. And then to start thinking a little bit about um, how they can use OKRs. We hear from leaders of these types of teams often, Peter, where they want to implement OKRs, like they really want to implement the framework, but they feel from their teams or they feel that it's impossible for their type of team. And I think this is a great topic. And I want to talk about, I think the official title will be OKRs for teams that can't predict the future. Peter, for example, you have research teams that don't know when they're going to discover something, right? They're putting all their efforts behind this one hypothesis and task, but don't know when it's going to happen. Or a customer service or operations team that doesn't know how many calls they're going to get in their support center today or this quarter. What's your take on those teams using OKRs? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of these teams, I think, exist because of uncertainty, not in spite of uncertainty. So for things like research, operations, support, uh, I think they can look at how they work, not necessarily on what they will deliver. So rather than trying to kind of engineer all the uncertainty out of the system, you can look at the bits of the system that you do have control over. Look at the areas where you do have some budget to, to uh, innovate and improve things, and then OKRs are a really natural fit there. So for example, if you're in a research uh, type capacity and a research team, as you say, you don't know when you're going to make a major breakthrough, but you can certainly use OKRs to get better at making breakthroughs in general. You can get faster at testing hypotheses. You can improve the quality of your data. You can get better at communicating those results to people. Same with operations. You can look at the rate at which you can triage things. You can look at uh, how quickly you can share information or the ability that you have to run post-incident reviews so that you can make sure that you maximize your learning. 
So in all of these cases, you're not trying to predict through your OKRs what's going to happen, but you can use whatever kind of budget you have within that frame to innovate and improve things to say, all right, we're going to use OKRs to get better at how we approach this work. And, and I've seen that happen as well with uh, teams working in, in legal and looking at how they handle cases uh, or teams in finance, looking at how they, they handle reconciliation. Uh, a lot of kind of BAU tasks that um, are a little bit just feel like maybe turning the crank, but you can, in any of those cases, in any of those teams, you do have a little bit of, of capacity, a little bit of uh, budget, if you like, to innovate and change. And that's where OKRs can really shine. I, lo- I love that advice because it's uh, really asking teams to answer the question, which I think most members of a team can. How can we do our work better in the quarter ahead, right? How can we improve how we operate? And everyone probably can raise their hand and make not only a series of suggestions of how, but how to probably measure what good really looks like or what a better team and how it operates looks like. Exactly. I think one one other layer of uh, kind of guidance we give at the What Matters team too is while that will help you as a team if you're on the research side, operation side, or even some you know startups in some case here too, where you're still building and discovering what works for your product and market, that we encourage creating what we call a learning OKR as well, mm-hmm. right? A lot of times OKRs are very directional. We know mm-hmm. where success is, we know what it looks like down the road, right? That goal line. But often there are moments when, you know, let's pick on research teams and startups or new things that you're creating in a large organization, you don't quite know what success looks like uh, from a like output outcome point of view, but you really can phrase it as what are we trying to learn this quarter, right? What do we need to learn? What do we need to prove? Very hypothesis-like to say that this is an effort worth continuing. And so we really love to encourage teams that say, you know, OKRs aren't for me. You know, take Peter's advice too. Mm-hmm. Like, well, figure out how you can use OKRs to make your work better. Or we say, well, if OKRs aren't for you, is it because you don't actually quite know yet which direction you want to go all in on. And if that's the case, use a learning OKR. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm hearing from both of you is that for these kinds of teams, it really takes a little bit of abstract thinking. So thinking about more about the how over the what, and thinking about your comment on ways of working, Peter, um, I'm, I get confused, tactics. So what's the difference between OKRs and tactics or um, sometimes people call them initiatives, so tactics or initiatives? Yeah, that's a great question, Elizabeth. And I think for me, what it really boils down to, what I like to say is that you can use OKRs to describe how you want the future to look. You can use that to describe some end state that you want to arrive at in the future and and how that will look. Uh, The tactics, the initiatives, the tasks, all that is the stuff that you're going to do in order to get there. So, uh, you know, you can say, this is the destination we want to arrive at, but we're not going to prescribe a specific path to getting there. That's all in the tactics. And in that way, your tactics can be this ever-evolving kind of pipeline of hypotheses and things that you want to try. And you don't know, you might have to try 100 different things before you actually move the needle on those key results. But the great thing about separating them out into two separate entities is that your OKRs give you that clear destination where you want to end. And that gives you all kinds of freedom to operate in terms of what you will do to get there, because then your initiatives are this, again, kind of constantly evolving um, uh, pipeline or backlog of things that you can keep trying until you get to the, um, the ultimate goal. And there's the famous example of how Google had, uh, I think it was like six quarters or something where they wanted to get a million people onto Chrome. And you know, it took a lot of different initiatives, a lot of tactics to make that happen, but they never lost sight of that, uh, that ultimate destination where they wanted to get to. Love the words you use, freedom to operate. Like that's the powerful thing about OKRs, right? It is a team describing the destination, but how you get there, you have to leave that room for the team to be able to not only come up with it, but be okay uh, scrapping mm-hmm. it, trying something new, doing more of it. And so, you know, you know, to paraphrase John, OKRs are not meant to be the sum of all tasks, right? They're the most important things. They're the direction we want to go. And there are a lot of other systems that are far well better designed to track tasks and activities and roadmaps and timelines. So I'm with you, Peter. (laughs) That's a a great point as well, Ryan. I mean, OKRs are not a project management framework. They are not even really an execution framework. They're more of an alignment framework, I think. And they give you that constant reassurance that you're heading in the right direction, or they make it painfully obvious if you're not, and you need to kind of uh, uh, re-maneuver or change directions. But, uh, but there, as you say, there are so many other frameworks that are out there for, for helping you to actually manage the, uh, the day-to-day task stuff. This is much more of a directional kind of, yeah, are we there yet kind of thing. 
my favorite piece of advice I've gotten from uh, Alan Eustace, who is the uh, you know claim Googler that jumped from a balloon right in this. Uh, I mean, I think he's yeah, he does hold the world record for jumping at, from the stratosphere, right? Uh, yes. And um, anybody looking up Alan Eustace, there will be a link somewhere here. But you know what he always shared about OKRs and how they used them was as soon as an OKR turns from green to yellow or yellow to red, right? When you're checking in on them, how we feel about them. Mm. It really instigates a team to come up with a plan. Oh, well, how do we move that red back to a yellow or yellow back to a green? And mm. so that kind of reaction to this OKR you set is what you want to see happen with your teams. So yes. Elizabeth, sorry about that. I, uh, Oh, no. I, I sometimes I seriously, I get so mesmerized by what you're saying, because actually, just like I asked for clarification on tactics and initiatives, oftentimes we hear from our readers outcomes versus outputs. And mm -hmm. I feel like this aligns. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on outcomes versus outputs? And I'll uh, call on Ryan first this time. Ah, okay. This is, I think this is a, uh, the internal debate or the uh, eternal debate that you can see online. Like are OKRs only about outcomes? Are they about outputs? Or are they about inputs, right? This whole set of things you can pick from, you know, our philosophy, at least on the What Matters team is that it's really up to the crafter, the mm -hmm. team that's setting them to decide, right? Because you can approach leadership in many ways, inputs or the Jeff Bezos approach, because those are the things you control. Outputs are, you know, the Andy Grove. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. The Drucker style and outputs are a great way to do that. But really, outcomes are the things you want to change. If anything, they're the hardest sometimes things to measure and the hardest things to add up to. And so our advice there, and, you know, Elizabeth, I'm preaching to the choir to you, and I think for folks who come read the content we have, it's like, have an outcome mentality, but don't be afraid to set an input or output KR if it helps really reinforce the direction you're setting your team. And so that's that's our our, our take on that. Peter, what's what's been your your yeah, point I of think view? And there, there's so many um there's so many tools you have at your disposal when you're setting OKRs in terms of things that we can measure. And and you know, the way that OKRs kind of grew out of that lineage of KPIs and things, there's this whole history of well, let's measure everything, which is good, but you know, it's kind of like what you're saying, it's let's measure what matters, right? Let's let's figure out those things that are really prescient and important for us and what success looks like for us. And and I think sometimes actually, you know, you can be very dogmatic and say, oh, your OKR should never contain any anything that even smells like an initiative that should stay out. But for me, uh, one, of the, one of the things that took me a long time to realize is that yes, there is a difference between your OKRs and your initiatives, but also you don't have to be so rigid and so dogmatic. I've worked with teams where they have some great OKRs and then said, oh, and also we need to do this. <laughs> you know, we need to get this thing. This thing needs to happen in order for everything else to, to come together and for us to be happy. And, you know, I used to really push back on that. And, and more recently, though, I've kind of realized, you know, if that helps you to complete the whole picture and to get where you need to go, great. Put that in there, in there as a key result. Uh, do, do what you need to do uh, so that your team is enthusiastic and excited and fired up about looking at these OKRs because that's the other thing is, is you want OKRs that you are excited to check in on every week or as often as, you, as you're doing this, because the minute that your OKRs feel like a distraction or they feel like you know, the, the sideshow, then you, you've you got to change them, right? They're, they're not the right things to be looking at. Uh, and so sometimes, I guess, if, if a, a couple of initiatives creep in or, or some different kinds of leading and lagging indicators that maybe don't feel quite uh, like they fit the traditional OKR model, I'm, I'm much more... Uh, I think it's interesting when that happens, and I and I like to welcome that dialogue and say, well, maybe, maybe we should put that in there if that if that leads us to some OKRs that we're really excited about, then that's that's probably a good thing. So let's do some quick fire questions to sum everything up because I am definitely learning um, on this on this episode. <laughs> Ryan, I'm going to pick on you again because Peter is our guest. So just so that we're clear and kind of clearing everything up for me. How can teams make sure they're focused on outcomes over outputs? Because mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a tricky, I think it's hard yeah. to stop yourself from doing. I struggle yeah. with that sometimes. It's, it's really, you know, I'm borrowing Peter's words. It's like, it's like, what are, what are you trying to change? What is the difference that you're trying to make? The, the outcome really captures that. And, you know, it's uh you know, you can have a revenue target, which is an output, right? But an outcome is likely the satisfaction, the renewal rate. There's other things that truly mention, you know, that really measure the strength of an output. And that's what an outcome is. It's 
customer satisfaction. It's people coming back. It's not just, you know, knocks on doors and votes casted. It's like the person actually getting elected. It's perhaps the truest definition of what that success looks like. And it's really important, like, you know, we've said to, to craft that really succinctly as the KR that you want. But to Peter's advice and the you know, advice I shared earlier, you can set other KRs as well. Use your judgment. The point of OKRs are really to make them your own. You know, your team has to rally around them. If you find out that you're not starting your meetings with them and you're, you know, referring to other things, it likely means your OKRs aren't capturing the things that matter the most, right? So um, really be focused on what you're trying to change and what mm. measure can capture it. And if you don't know how to, you know, measure that measure, it usually means that, is it more instrumentation or do you have to find a way to build something that lets you, but um, it's, it's a really good frame. I think that will be really helpful because I know a, a lot of teams are setting Q2 now, and we talked about it in our last episode about using your grading after reflecting on it to build well, I believe your words to me, Ryan Worth. It's all about the next OKR, Elizabeth. It's all about the next one. He said. So um, I think that is really, really valuable advice. Now, Peter, I've given you a bit of a break here. So here is your quick fire question. So instead of trying to predict the unpredictable, and just to underline everything, what can teams use as starting points when setting OKRs? Mm. So yeah, I think if you're in one of these these funny teams that's not so product focused, uh, I would say, look at how you're delivering work today. Look at the way that you're measuring value. Look at uh, what you're bringing to your organization, to your context, and think about what kind of agreements you already have in place, what kind of commitments you've made. There are probably some SLAs and things like that that you're measuring. Uh, and then look at how you're doing that. You know, how well are you, not just how well are you meeting those SLAs, those service level agreements, but what techniques are you using? And are there bits where you have a little bit of freedom to do things differently? You know, I think that's probably the most important thing is to figure out what's in your control and what's out of your control. Because even if you're dealing with things that feel like they're totally out of your control, you always have some control around something. Uh, and actually, there, there, I, I heard a funny story once from a, um, a guy who uh, was a Navy SEAL and, and um, was trying to defuse a, a bomb or something that was attached to the bottom of an oil rig. And realized that he'd gotten tangled in all of this cabling and, and stuff underneath the oil rig, and he was totally stuck. And he realized he couldn't, couldn't move. But then he realized, well, I can still wiggle my toes. Okay, good. I'm going to start with that. I can kind of wiggle my ankles. And piece by piece, he managed to get himself out of this, uh, this situation and, um, and, and save the day. But, uh, so there's always a little bit of a, of a locus of control where you get to do a little bit of something. Do that one again, shorter. <laughs> no, I quite like that, I, I actually. Yeah, I was worried yeah. for the Navy SEAL. <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy story. It's, uh, I wish I could remember the guy who told me. And, um, but yeah, it was a great example of, you know, there's no matter how bad things look, there's always a little, little window. Yeah. Of, of Something you can change. Yeah. It's, it's a great story, right? Because it's like, I think we look to those stories for hope, right? And examples that, yes, even if you can make that small little change or difference, you know, Elizabeth, tying it back to our topic of predicting the future, there's mm. no way you can predict the future, but the hope with setting really great goals and OKRs and not being afraid to change them really helps you react and respond to the future, right? Like that's the intent because mm. you can imagine, I mean, we've all lived through the past year together and the teams that have thrived have reacted and responded. No one could have predicted the world that we were dealt, the hands that we were dealt this past year, whether at work and our families, but how you responded and reacted really is where, you know, things happened. And that's so I gold, think that's where the gold is, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's huge because I think the worst thing that an organization can do is, is mandate that everybody uses OKRs, whether they want to or not. And the, what's wonderful, though, is when a team realizes that OKRs are a tool for them to help them to get clearer on what they're doing and why and how they're doing it. And, and as soon as they start to really take ownership, then, then they say, yeah, th these OKRs that we set even two weeks ago, you know, those aren't working. We need to throw them out and do something completely different. And, and when you have that realization, you say, oh, yeah, these are for us. You know, these help yeah. us to deliver things and they help us to communicate outwardly with, with what we're doing. And suddenly then they become this kind of... Um, yeah, a place to really rally and uh, and, and work together. It's um, it, it really galvanizes people instead of feeling like another box they have to tick for the sake of a, you know, a, a, a an anxious PMO or something. Peter, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing your wisdom. How do people find you? 
Easiest thing is probably just to go to my website at peterkaplis.com or they can follow me on Twitter at Peter Kaplis. Perfect. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for listening and watching. And like we always say, we're here standing by for your questions about OKRs. We'll talk again soon. Keep up the momentum. You're doing great. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Bye, everybody.